a young woman was found dead on the floor of her own apartment. The police began an investigation and immediately uncovered several very alarming facts. It turned out that the residents of this complex had long noticed something strange and lived in fear. During the investigation, detectives learned more and more horrifying details until they finally arrived at an unexpected truth. But it was only the beginning. Stephanie Bennett was born on August 30, 1979, in the small American town of Rocky Mount, Virginia. When she was little, her parents divorced and Stephanie stayed with her mother. However, their father lived near their home and the young woman continued to see him almost every day. Later, her father remarried and Stephanie gained a stepsister named Diana. After school, Stephanie enrolled in Roanoke College, located 350 kilometers from her home. In her final year, she met a guy named Walter and they soon started dating. After college, the couple moved to different cities, but they continued to be together. Stephanie moved to the city of Raleigh, North Carolina with her stepsister Diana and their mutual friend Emily. The three of them rented an apartment in the Bridgeport Residential Complex located in a quiet, peaceful area on the outskirts of the city. The young woman found a job at IBM while her boyfriend moved to Greenville, South Carolina to obtain an engineering degree. Stephanie lived in Raleigh for about a year. By that time, she and her sister and friend were planning to move to different cities. The young woman, who was only 23 at the time, was planning to move to Greenville to be with her boyfriend, and the couple had already begun looking for a place to rent. In May, Stephanie went to Greenville, where she and Walter looked at several apartments and chose a suitable option for rent. When she returned to Raleigh, her friends and sister were no longer in the apartment. Emily had moved to another city, and Diana had gone away for a few days to attend a funeral. On the evening of May 20th, Stephanie came home from work and spoke to Walter on the phone. Her boyfriend was planning to send her a rental agreement via fax for her to sign. They agreed that he would send it the next day when she could use her work computer. The following day, Walter tried to reach her, but Stephanie didn't answer either her work or home phone. He then called her sister Diana, who contacted Stephanie's colleagues. It turned out that Stephanie didn't show up to work that day, which was very unusual. Stephanie was always responsible and would have informed her boss if she was sick. Moreover, if she was at home sick, she would have answered the phone. Diana asked her friend to go to their apartment and check if everything was okay. There was no answer when they knocked on the door. Then Diana asked the apartment manager to open the door with a spare key. As soon as the man entered the apartment, he saw a horrifying sight. Stephanie was lying lifeless on the floor of the room with no clothes on and bruises on her neck. The manager immediately called the police. Detectives found Stephanie's documents and confirmed that the deceased was indeed her through a photo. On the laundry basket cover, which was under the window in Emily's bedroom, investigators noticed leaves and concluded that the killer may have entered the apartment through the window. They also discovered that the home phone was in the closet in Emily's room and the cable was cut. Apparently, the perpetrator was hiding there and took the phone with him so Stephanie couldn't use it. After speaking with Diana, the police determined that several items were missing from the apartment. The perpetrator took $8 from Stephanie's wallet, two tape recorders, and the laundry basket from Stephanie's room. It seemed that he had put the stolen items inside the basket. Experts found semen on the victim's body and extracted a DNA sample but it wasn't in the FBI database. They also determined that the cause of death was strangulation. Interestingly, the perpetrator took the object he used to kill the victim with, as the police were unable to find it in the apartment. Meanwhile, investigators interviewed all the residents of the complex, hoping someone might have seen the killer. During these conversations, the police learned that something strange had been happening in the residential complex 
for several months. People regularly notice someone peeping at them through the windows of their apartments. They complain to the manager, but the management of the complex could not find the person. Interestingly, at least once this person was seen at Stephanie's window. In addition, several months ago, an unknown man near the lake near the complex assaulted a young woman who went for a run. After this incident, Stephanie was afraid to stay alone in this apartment and wanted to move to Greenwell as soon as possible. Detectives studied the area around the complex and discovered something strange. In the bushes, they found dozens of pieces of women's underwear, which, as later turned out, belonged to Stephanie. The police thought the killer took them out of the apartment, but then, for some reason, threw them in the bushes. However, soon this version was refuted. It turned out that a teenager living in the neighboring apartment regularly sneaked into Stephanie's room and stole her underwear, after which he threw it into the bushes. He admitted this when investigators questioned all the residents, but he denied his involvement in the murder. His DNA sample was taken, and it did not match the sample obtained from the killer's semen. For this reason, he was no longer suspected of the crime. The police believed that the most obvious candidate for the role of the killer was the same man who repeatedly peeped at the female residents of the complex through the windows. After talking to everyone who had ever noticed this person, the detectives compiled an approximate portrait. It was published in newspapers, but it did not yield any results. As part of the standard procedure, Investigators checked the victim's boyfriend. He voluntarily gave his DNA, which did not match the killer's sample. In addition, at the time of the murder, Walter was hundreds of kilometers away from her home and physically could not have been there. After that, the police went to all the male residents of the complex, asking them to voluntarily give their DNA. This also did not yield any results. The experts did not find a single match among the 283 samples obtained. At this point, they did not have any serious leads. Detectives organized surveillance of the residential complex, hoping to catch the man who was spying on the residents. To their surprise, they quickly succeeded. On June 3rd, the police noticed a man who approached several windows on the ground floor and peered into the apartments. Stopping at one of the windows, this person began to satisfy himself, and the police immediately arrested him. This pervert turned out to be Christopher Lee Campen, who had been caught spying several times before and had been convicted of stalking a woman three years earlier. The detectives thought they had finally caught the killer, but they were disappointed. Christopher's DNA did not match the sample found on the victim's body. He was charged with spying, but they stopped considering him a suspect in the murder case. Since then, the police continued to work on the case, but they had no substantial leads. A year later, the lead detective heard about a lab in Florida that could determine a person's ethnicity based on their DNA. However, he had doubts about this technology, but he didn't want to miss such an opportunity. As a test, he sent the DNA of four of his colleagues of different ethnicities to the lab. The experts succeeded in their task, 100%, and the detective sent them the DNA of Stephanie's killer. The lab determined that the DNA belonged to a white person, but this information did not help the police much. In August 2003, the victim's father offered a reward of $100,000 for any information that would lead to the capture of the killer. Her mother wrote a letter which was published in local newspapers begging people to share with the police any information that could help identify the suspect. All of this brought some new leads, but they did not lead anywhere. In April 2004, based on the testimony of multiple witnesses, detectives decided to interview all residents of the complex again. They suspected that the man arrested for voyeurism might not have been the only one who walked around the complex buildings and peeked into other people's windows. Knowing the identity of the first man and having his photographs, the investigators wanted to talk to the residents who had seen the voyeur again. 
Unfortunately, none of them had ever seen his face. Most often, this man appeared at night, and he almost always wore a hood. However, some witnesses said they saw him without the hood, but could only see that he had long hair. Detectives interviewed several dozen people until they finally reached a man who saw this person right in front of Stephanie's window before her murder. His testimony was already with the police, but this time he remembered something else. The witness claimed that he saw this person a few days after the incident during daylight hours. This man was walking his dog near the wooded area behind the residential complex, and the witness recognized him by his hoodie. He watched him for a while until he disappeared behind the trees with his Labrador. Apparently, the witness simply forgot about this incident or did not think it was related to the murder. So during the initial questioning, the police did not receive this information. One thing is for sure, detectives only obtained this information two years after Stephanie's death. Now they knew they should be looking for a man with a Labrador. Judging by the fact that this person was walking his dog in the area, he must have lived nearby. And here the detectives noted one interesting fact. Behind the forested area where the witness saw the man, there was another residential complex. Given that the dog owner headed in that direction, he could well have lived there. The police went there and asked the staff if there was a man with a Labrador among the complex residents. They immediately gave them the name of 35-year-old Drew Planton, as well as added a few interesting details. All the complex employees considered him somewhat strange. He hardly talked to anyone, never looked people in the eye, and was generally very unsociable. The man was very thin with long hair and always wore baggy clothes. Many people thought he was trying to attract as little attention as possible. In his case, however, it worked just the opposite. The police decided to find out more about this person and talk to an elderly resident who, according to the staff, kept an eye on everything happening in the complex. And here, they were in for a very unexpected turn. When they told her they were investigating the murder of Stephanie Bennett, the woman replied, haven't you arrested anyone yet? Everyone knows it was that guy with the big dog. The detectives were, to say the least, shocked. It took them two years to get to this person, and the residents of his complex initially suspected this man, but none of them deemed it necessary to share their suspicions with the police. It turned out that Drew had moved out of that complex and settled on the other side of town. The investigators decided to talk to him and came to his apartment, but no one responded to their knock on the door. They came there several more times at different times of the day and never received an answer. Either the man was never home or he intentionally did not open the door for them. While they tried to locate Drew, the police questioned his former neighbors at his old place of residence. They managed to find several witnesses who shared troubling facts. A woman living on the floor above had seen Drew in the company of a young boy a few days after Stephanie's murder. They were walking down the street and talking about something. According to the witness, Drew asked the boy to stop contacting the police and not to tell them anything. The investigators immediately concluded that the young man in question was the same teenager who had stolen underwear from the victim's apartment. Several women had reported being genuinely afraid of Drew having spotted him during their runs or walks in secluded areas. The man would either closely observe them or even follow them. Detectives who had been unable to speak with Drew found his place of work and headed there. He was a chemist at a fertilizer production laboratory and the investigators managed to catch him at his workplace. He immediately stated that he had not heard of Stephanie Bennett's murder, which was strange considering that he lived just a kilometer away from her complex at the time. The man clearly had no desire to talk to the police and told them he was very busy at the moment. Drew told the investigators that they could come to his home at an appointed time and he would answer all their questions. The detectives met him at his apartment and the man finally opened the door to them. During the conversation, he stated that he had never walked his dog near Stephanie's complex However, given that the police 
had many witnesses who had repeatedly seen him in that area, the investigators immediately understood that he was lying. The man also claimed that he did not wear glasses, even though his driver's license indicated that he was required to wear them while driving, and several witnesses had reported that the man who was peeping into the windows of other apartments wore glasses. As expected, Drew refused to voluntarily provide a DNA sample. The detectives then decided to conduct surveillance on him, hoping to obtain a sample in a different way. However, this proved to be a very difficult task since the man did not leave behind any items that could be sent to the laboratory. For example, during lunch breaks, he would leave work, sit in his car, and just stare at one point. The man did not eat anything so the investigators could not obtain any objects with his DNA. Once they noticed Drew throwing an empty water bottle into a garbage bin, detectives took it and sent it to the laboratory, but experts were unable to extract a DNA sample from it. According to one version, Drew took someone else's bottle and purposely threw it on the street, knowing that he was being watched. After that, the police decided to obtain his garbage, but here too they were unsuccessful. For several days, they never saw Drew take it out. Interestingly, the man's neighbors also could not remember ever seeing him with a trash bag. Next, investigators asked Drew's boss for help. The woman agreed to help them obtain any item from his workplace that might contain Drew's DNA. She watched him for several days, but was unable to get a hold of any item. Drew rarely ate at work, never threw anything away, and she couldn't find a single hair on his desk, which seemed strange given that the man had fairly long hair. Investigators were already convinced that Drew was intentionally covering up all traces to prevent them from obtaining his DNA. One day, the boss saw him tying his hair back with a rubber band and then bending down to pick up all the hairs that fell in the process. After that, the woman decided to invite him for a lunch break at a cafe to supposedly discuss some work matters. But even there, the man was extremely cautious. He mostly ate with his hands, put all the used napkins in his pocket, and even took the straw and cup with his drink. For dessert, they ordered banana pudding, and Drew finally used a fork, but then wiped it with a damp napkin for 15 minutes, ruling out any possibility of obtaining a DNA sample from the utensil. Despite this, the investigator still took the fork and sent it to the laboratory. The experts were able to find tiny traces of DNA, which showed a partial match with the DNA of Stephanie's killer. However, the result was too imprecise, as more biological material was needed for a full comparison. In the end, the detectives obtained a warrant to search Drew's workplace. They hoped to find some item containing his DNA. The investigators were afraid that the man might escape if he found out about the search, so they decided to conduct it in the evening. Among the suspect's belongings, they found gloves that he had to wear when working with chemicals. The detectives understood that his DNA might be inside, so they took them and left another pair in their place. They still feared that Drew might try to run, so they kept him under surveillance for several days until the laboratory confirmed that the gloves did, in fact, contain his DNA. On October 18, 2005, police quietly surrounded the laboratory where a man worked and waited for him to come out. Investigators feared that if they tried to arrest him inside the building, he might take one of his colleagues hostage or attack them. Their concerns were not unfounded. When the man emerged from the building, he was immediately apprehended. He was found to have a loaded pistol on him and apparently knew that the police were just steps away from catching him and had no plans to surrender easily. During a six-hour interrogation, the man, Drew, remained silent and refused food, water, and hardly moved. Eventually, detectives had to put him in a wheelchair to move him around the area. After obtaining a search warrant for his apartment, investigators found a laundry basket stolen from Stephanie's home. In addition, there were nine pistols, two rifles, 40 knives, a sword, and a machete. Among his belongings, detectives also found a set of lockpicks and handcuffs. 
They found a notebook with dozens of women's names and immediately located them to ensure they were safe. One of the women was the same resident of his complex who had complained about Drew during the investigation. She said that he had been watching her on the street and she felt uncomfortable with his gaze. Her concerns were confirmed when police found her underwear and tampons in Drew's home, as well as a copy of her high school graduation tape. It turned out that Drew had broken into her apartment, taken the tape, made a copy, and returned the original. All this time, he kept these items even after moving. In his apartment, they also found a check in the name of a woman who was killed in 1999. Investigators learned that at the time, Drew lived in her city and, moreover, the woman was shot with a fairly rare caliber gun but exactly such a weapon was found in the man's collection during the search. Thus, Drew became a suspect in this case, but first he had to stand trial for the murder of Stephanie. A month after his arrest, the prosecution officially announced that they would seek the death penalty. The trial was supposed to begin the following year, and Drew spent that time in solitary confinement, but the trial never happened. On January 1, 2006, a man was found dead in the same cell. Despite all precautions taken, he managed to end his life. Investigators had no doubt that Drew had killed Stephanie Bennett, but after a search of his house, the inevitable question arose. How many other victims could this person have had? At the very least, he was highly likely to have been responsible for the woman's murder in 1999, but detectives were practically certain that Drew could have been involved in other crimes. After carefully studying his biography, the police discovered several interesting facts. Drew grew up in a complete family with three brothers. Their father constantly humiliated and beat the children until the mother fled with them to another state. As a result, Drew became a very withdrawn teenager, and this only intensified in the future. Despite this, he received a good education and got a decent job as a chemist. His colleagues said he was very smart, but his social skills were practically non-existent. He had no friends, he didn't talk to anyone at work, and always tried to keep as far away from the team as possible. Interestingly, Drew's own brother also had a criminal record. He peeped at women with a hidden camera and received a suspended sentence. In 2008, Drew's mother sued the state government, accusing the authorities of causing her son's death. However, the judge concluded that the prison staff had taken all prescribed precautions and could not stop the man. Stephanie Bennett's father tried to sue the management of the residential complex for ignoring residents' reports of a peeping Tom and not paying enough attention to the safety of residents on the premises. In his opinion, there was not enough lighting around the building at night, and anyone could walk there unnoticed. He also learned that the window in his daughter's apartment had been broken, but the complex management did not rush to fix this problem, even though it was their direct responsibility. But in the end, the man himself refused these accusations, not commenting on his decision. Thus, this complex and confusing case was ultimately solved. Police to this day wonder how many other victims could Drew have had. The available information indicates that the man was prone to serial crimes, but after his death, it became practically impossible to find out the truth. Share your opinion in the comments. Don't forget to like this video if you liked it. Thank you for watching.